Every year, 6% of Bahamian children are born with a heart defect. We at Cable 12. And the Nassau Guardian decided to lend a helping hand in creating more awareness to the cause of saving little hearts. One surgery can cost up to $250,000. We at Cable 12 and the Nassau Guardian hear their cry. We are asking you to make a donation to these efforts. Embrace the opportunity. And save a little heart. Good evening, Bahamas. You're tuned into NB12, broadcasting from Cable 12 Studios on Robinson Road. Here's what's making news tonight. Dr. Arthur Potter speaking on camera for the first time since his arrest warrant was issued. Officials respond to the cause of death of a man in custody. No itemized mid-year budget. Plus, oil still spilling in Inagua waters. Those stories and much more on the way. And the Kia DeVoe and NB12 starts right now. Days after Canadian authorities issued an arrest warrant for local cancer center managing director Dr. Arthur Porter, government officials confirmed today that they have not yet received any formal request for extradition. The Sierra Leone native sat down with NB12 for his first television interview since the warrant was issued. Dr. Porter told Arkandia Dames he's suffering from stage 4 cancer and is unfit to travel. He also says he is innocent and willing to fight those very serious fraud-related allegations. Dr. Potter has spent more than two decades helping many hundreds of patients fight the dreaded cancer disease, including 1,000 Bahamian patients. These days, he himself is a patient fighting for his very life amid very serious allegations that have surfaced in Canada. The former chief executive of the McGill University Health Center, who is now a Bahamas permanent resident, is facing several fraud-related charges stemming from the construction of Montreal's $1.3 billion super hospital. He sat down with NB12 at his home to discuss the controversy and what he told us is stage 4 lung cancer, which has so far resisted treatment. It's unfortunately growing a bit, but we're on this new one. And you know, if you're going to do something, you've got to battle it well. And so, even though the, these tablets are, are really quite difficult and the drugs are quite hard to take, um, and um, the side effects are not so good either, I still smile, sort of. Dr. Potter, who is on oxygen, told us he's so weak he's not been able to leave his bedroom in days. And so that's where we conducted the interview. We asked him about the fraud claims connected to the construction of the super hospital. I know that the entire design was such that it would be almost impossible unless you got a coalition of 40 or 50 people to work together from two or three different agencies to be able to swing a process like that. And if you look at the types of bidders on the process, and there were only two bidders, they were of such a size and power and connections within the, within the province and things that they themselves did not need people like me, a guy who hardly spoke French and who was a hospital administrator, to deal with what they needed to do within the province. We also asked Dr. Potter directly whether he is guilty of corruption. No, 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 no. You see, and this is a fair comment, and you know my answer, so I'll say, in relationship to that bid process, I still think it's a most brilliant process around. And we asked him about his relationship with Prime Minister Perry Christie. I think he's a very good person. He was Prime Minister when I came. And, um, you know, I told him that we would provide a radiotherapy center of high quality, and I kept my word. And um, I think he's been a supporter of the center. And, um, and if, you know, I've been open. He's been, uh, when it's come to advice, say, like stem cell therapy, etc., I've provided my advice where I've been able to. Um, I look at Bahamas as home, and so I want to see it successful. 
While Dr. Potter says he is willing to fight the alleged fraud relating to that hospital contract in Montreal, he spoke repeatedly of an even bigger fight. Absolutely at the right time. I think the key is that I need to be at the right time. I mean, I, right now I have a tumor that potentially is growing. I think I'd like to know that it's not growing. Now, there's no question that I'd like this behind me. It's just a question of priorities. The first is, what is life-threatening? And the second, what is reputationally threatening? Okay, And I'd like to deal with the life-threatening one first. While Dr. Potter says he is a fighter and would be prepared to fight whatever comes his way, he stressed that for now, his fight and his focus is on saving his life. Reporting for NB12, I'm Candia Dames. The cause of death of one of the men who recently died in police custody has been revealed. A pathologist said 35-year-old Jamie Smith died from a lack of oxygen while in police custody at the Central Detective Unit. Today, the head of CDU and the Minister of National Security weighed in on the findings. While officer in charge of the CDU, Superintendent Paul Roll, confirmed that the death certificate does list Smith's cause of death as asphyxia, he says that does not explain the full circumstances surrounding the suspect's death. Roll says the public must not jump to conclusions until a full coroner's inquest is completed. He said sometimes police officers are treated unfairly in the court of public opinion, adding that officers have rights as well and have been taking a beating from members of the public without any facts. Meantime, during an interview with NB12 this afternoon, Minister of National Security Dr. Bernard Nottage said this is the first he's hearing of the findings. No such findings have been made clear to me. Smith died while in police custody at the Central Detective Unit back on February 8th, and his family members have been demanding to know the cause of his death ever since. They have always maintained he was in good health until his arrest and subsequent death. A pathologist determined that Smith died from lack of oxygen. Dr. Nottage said he will not speculate and is also waiting the report from the coroner's inquest. An inquest into Smith's case is tentatively set for March 26th. If the, if the report from that is not satisfactory, then we, might, we may have to find other ways to investigate it. Um, my only concern is that these matters are dealt with as quickly as possible, and that the law will take its course, right, so you as it has done. Smith and two other men were arrested on suspicion of armed robbery. He became the third suspect to die at CDU since 2010, and all of those cases remain before the coroner's court. Nottage said that anyone in the care of police officers is entitled to be safe from harm. He added that if it is found that there was foul play in Smith's or any suspect's death, officers will be dealt with in accordance with the law. We do follow the laws in this country. So somebody, uh, if someone dies, there's an investigation. If, if it is believed that this death was caused illegally by someone, that person is charged. That person goes to court and the court makes a decision as to what happens to them, not the Minister of National Security. The family's attorney, Christina Galanos, told the Nassau Guardian that she is still waiting for a copy of Smith's autopsy report from the coroner. Well, the government has chosen not to give a detailed update of the country's financial position halfway through the fiscal year. The practice of providing the public with an itemized mid-year budget was started a few years ago under the Ingram administration. However, Minister of State for Finance Michael Halkidis said the government believes the exercise is a waste of time and resources. Paige McCartney reports. A debate began in the House of Assembly today on a package of bills that are a part of the government's mid-year budget. However, one thing was missing, the actual budget. Minister of State for Finance Michael Halkidis echoed much of what was announced by Prime Minister Perry Christie last week during his mid-year budget communication, revealing the country's dire fiscal position, which requires the government to borrow another $100 million to cover unpaid checks and wire transfers and lump sum payments to public servants. And while Halkidis pointed out that the projected deficit of $550 million at the beginning of the fiscal year has dropped to $532 million, that that's outside of the $100 million about to be borrowed. Halkidis also said revenue is down from what was forecasted at the start of the budget year from $1.55 billion to $1.43 billion. Almost everything that possibly could go wrong from a fiscal perspective did in fact go, go wrong. Most of the core components of the fiscal framework were off track with revenues being down both on the recurrent side and on the capital side and by capital expenditure 
um, being overshooting the forecast by some $115 million. But unlike past mid-year budgets, the government has chosen not to reveal the line items that detail revenue shortfalls and expenditure overruns. The state minister told MB12 outside of the House of Assembly that the government considers it a waste of resources to print out all the details of government spending twice a year. In our opinion, to go through the process of printing budget booklets twice in a year, I mean, it's really not a, an effective use of resources. We want people to get a snapshot of where we are, which is in this statement, and um, what we project at the end of the year. But opposition leader Dr. Hubert Minnis is suggesting the government is hiding something. He said they've overspent and they don't want the Bahamian people to know it. That's why they didn't present a full detailed mid-year budget. This is the most disorganized budget that I've ever seen. Ms. Speaker, Ms. Speaker, Ms. Speaker, there is no documentation, there's no media budget here for us to analyze. There are no figures. It's not a budget. There are no figures. And Ms. Speaker, during a standard media budget, a budget is presented where figures are analyzed so that you can go through head to head and the speaker all of that is missing. And according to Halkidis, Bahamians won't have any line item indicators until the government presents the 2013-2014 budget. It will be presented on the 29th of May, which is the last Wednesday in May. Following that, we propose to refer to select committee of the House so they can analyze it, get a better understanding of what's happening and then the budget debate starts. Halkidis noted that's just 86 days away. For MB12, I'm Paige McCartney.